this academic ceremony in which Ricardo Chiquera de Abru will defend the academic thesis extracellular vesicles as platforms for therapeutic microRNA delivery. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis? Yes. Thank you for the introduction, Mr. Prorector. I'll share my screen. And now, uh, dear Mr. Prorector, members of the Corona, dear family, friends, and audience, in the coming 15 minutes, I will shortly present the work that I've been doing during my PhD entitled Extracellular Vesicles as Platforms for Therapeutic MicroRNA Delivery. And as the title of my thesis suggests, my work pertains mostly to extracellular vesicles. But before we understand what those are, we have to understand, as most things in life, where they come from. And they come from cells. And what are cells? Cells are the building block of life. They are the primary unit of any living organism. And cells have the ability to produce and release a number of different structures and molecules. And one of the different uh, substances that they can produce and release are the extracellular vesicles or EVs. And these vesicles, uh, because they come from cells, they have a membrane structure and they contain molecules that are originally found within cells. You can think, for example, of nutrients or proteins and lipids. In other words, if you want to compare and say that the cell would be a book author, then you might imagine that extracellular vesicles are the books that that particular author may produce and release himself. And just like the book, any book from an author will have a particular style, a signature and hallmarks of the author who wrote it, so do extracellular vesicles carry the molecular signature and hallmarks of the cell that originally produced them. And then along these lines, it might also make sense to understand that cells in the body are not all the same. And for example, a cell in the heart will be different from a cell in the brain. And consequently, the vesicles that those two cells may produce will be different. They will contain a different sort of cargo. This is like if you imagine that you're picking a book from a library section, um, any book that you pick from a particular section will be different from any other book that you might pick in any other section of the library. And why does all this matter? Because ultimately these vesicles by carrying molecules that come from cells, they are meant to deliver them to other cells and we call those the target cells. And in the same vein, so too do books deliver their contents and information to a target audience, to the reader. And why does this all in particular uh, matter? Because as books uh, are read by a target audience, they may influence them and they may elicit different types of responses by the reader. In the same vein, so do vesicles influence the fate of target cells and their behavior. They might cause them to grow, they might cause them to shrink or to start dividing. But perhaps the therapeutic potential of extracellular vesicles might be better illustrated when we think about its applications on cells that are sick, cells that are not quite healthy. But if we may administer vesicles that carry this bioactive cargo, we might be able to fix whatever is wrong with this cell and produce a healthy cell. And this is the fundamental paradigm of using extracellular vesicles as a therapeutic tool. However, there are challenges uh, when we use extracellular vesicles as a therapeutic tool, because no vesicle is tailor-made for a specific therapeutic application. There are challenges that they must overcome in order to be used as a tool. And this is like, if you think about the literary genre, which may appeal to a certain kind of reader, but it will never be uh, completely uh, transversal to all types of situations where you might want uh, to have an impact on the reader. And this is where the mindset from my, for my project came in. We thought about, well, what if we try to change these vesicles in a way that are more appealing to our target audience? And here is 
where we outlined our objectives and we started with trying to enrich an extracellular vesicle to deliver specific therapeutic compounds. And when I mention specific therapeutic compounds in the context of this work, I'm mostly referring to microRNA. And what are those? Well, microRNA are small RNA molecules which have the ability to influence and determine cell fate and behavior when they are taken up by a cell. You may think of them as extra information, notes or messages that we might want to include in our book. And then, Consequently, we want to assess uh, how modifying the vesicles by enriching them in these extra notes, this extra content, might change their biology. And what I mean by this is, for example, imagine that we are changing the cover of our books. Would that then mean that the response from the audience is different? Are we targeting a different audience altogether? And finally, we also set out to develop new platforms to enrich these extracellular vesicles. And that means to discover new methods through which to get the microRNA, so these extra nodes, into the extracellular vesicles. But first, we have to get our vesicles. And for you to understand a little bit better what I'm talking about, here in this um, high magnification picture of electron microscopy, you can see more or less how extracellular vesicles may present themselves. But first, we have to collect them from the source. And collecting vesicles from the source is not so different than getting a large loan from the public library, for example. And one thing that we have to do in this case is to identify markers that are commonly found in extracellular vesicles to ensure that the material we are getting is in fact what we think it is. And you might think, well, if they present themselves as vesicles, they have the typical size and structure of vesicles, why wouldn't they be vesicles? Well, you'd be surprised at the amount of things that would fulfill those criteria and are not vesicles. And this is like, you, you are confirming that in the loan that you got from the library, the, 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 the books that present themselves have the hallmarks characteristic of a book, for example, the spine, the case, or the cloth covering. And equally as important, we also have to uh, find out whether there are contaminants present in our sample. And that is like uh, finding out uh, whether our book sample would be mixed in with something else uh, that we don't really want. So we don't want any flyers, magazines, and we certainly don't want any billboards in our uh, books that we want to give to our target audience. And so we must confirm that there are no such contaminants present in our sample. But once we have our vesicle samples, then we set out to enrich them with the microRNA. So those extra notes and information that we want to get in our vesicles. And to do this, we tested five different methods. And you can think of it like we tried five different strategies to get the notes in our books. You might say we tried gluing them, stapling them, or pinning them in the book. And out of all the five methods that we tested, that there was this one protocol in particular called the ExoFact protocol, which was more efficient than the rest. And it was, in fact, able to get the microRNA complex with the extracellular vesicle as we had intended. So, in fact, we were able to get the notes on the book. But then one thing is to say, yes, we got our extra information in the book. The other is to say that our target audience is reading what we wrote in those notes and not just skimming past the notes and reading at the book as it was before. And that is what we set out to test next, where we had our target audience in this case were some cells that were very red. But if they were able to read the microRNA that was present in the extracellular vesicles, they would become less red over time. And this is exactly what happened. So in this case, we were able to say that the audience is in fact interested in reading what our notes, the microRNA has to say. Then we have to ask ourselves the question, uh, if this enrichment with microRNA has the ability to change or in some way has altered the biology of these vesicles. And to do this, we tested other molecules on the membrane of the vesicle. So think about the cover of the book. And to our surprise, we found out that, imagine we tried pinning the notes on the book, on the cover, there were leftover pins from the protocol that we used. And we were not expecting that. 
And furthermore, then we had to ask ourselves the question, well, how is our audience rea reacting to the fact that uh, it's being given books to read with pins on its cover? And to our surprise again, not only was the audience, uh, in this case, the target cells, uh, reading our message um, as we intended, but they were doing so to a higher extent in the same time frame uh, when compared to the normal book. So the vesicles that were not altered. So in this case, if our book reaches the target audience, then our book decorated with pins and our extra notes reaches the audience to a higher extent. And, but then we want to actually apply this uh, as a treatment option for certain types of diseases. And as a proof of concept, we tested our technology with the vesicles and the microRNA on a diabetic mouse model with skin lesions. And as you know, uh, skin lesions in diabetic patients, they heal very poorly. So our microRNA that we used in this scenario was meant to fix that problem. And to compare and to control our experiment, we had what we call a scramble uh, control. And for you to understand this a little bit better, imagine that the microRNAs are, like I mentioned, the notes, the extra message that we want our cells to read. Then the scramble is also a note with something written on it, but is, it's only gibberish. It's not meant to have an effect. And we want to have this type of control because we want to be able to say that any effect that is caused uh, or is observed by the treatment is due to what was exactly written on the note, and that is the microRNA that we give them, and not by the fact that there was a note to begin with. So we gave the vesicles and the controls to the wounds in the mouse over 10 days, and we measured the size of the wounds on the skin of the mouse. And we verified that when the wounds were given vesicles with the microRNA, uh, they closed faster than they would otherwise. So, in fact, we conclude that when we do this approach, uh, the target audience is reading our book and is changing its behavior and healing faster. But then, we finally, we wanted to discover uh, novel compounds for uh, enriching extracellular vesicles. And you might wonder, well, if our protocol so far, our approach has been working uh, quite well, why the need to discover novel compounds? Well, if you think about it, uh, in a way, um, some target audiences might be interested in reading a book that is decorated in pins, but that might not be suitable for all applications. And that is why we set out to discover uh, me methods that would be able to do this complexation. So get the microRNA in the vesicle, get the note in the book, but with a seamless integration of the information. That is, for example, if you have the first book and then it becomes the complete trilogy, you have a seamless integration of content in the book without fundamentally changing anything about its nature. And that is precisely what we wanted to discover. And to this end, we outlined uh, a protocol that would enable us to find compounds with disability to get the microRNA in the vesicles without fundamentally changing them. And it was important for us to do so, to get a protocol that would be able to do this systematically, because we ended up testing over 1,200 compounds. And out of all those 1,200 compounds that we tested, only six of them were able to actually uh, complex the microRNA with the vesicles in the way that we had wanted, above the significance threshold. And out of all those six, subsequently, only two of them were actually further validated as promising candidates for the complexation of microRNA with the vesicles. So to summarize and to conclude, we can say that Exofact efficiently loads the extracellular vesicles with microRNA, alters their biology and produces a bioactive entity. And that, as we know, if our book reaches the target audience, in this case, our book decorated with pins and with its notes reaches the target audience to a higher extent and changes their behavior. And finally, that novel and improved compounds can be discovered for EV enrichment with microRNA and yield a higher value uh, EV-based therapeutic product. So that is a seamless integration 
of content into our extracellular vesicles, into our book. And with this, I thank you all for your attention and I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you very much for your presentation. I would like to give pass the chair uh, to Professor Schlerhers. He's a professor of biochemistry and vascular calcification of this university. Uh, professor Schlerhers. Thank you, uh, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, I want to congratulate you with this very nice and highly scientific and clinically relevant thesis, which I read with uh, a lot of pleasure. Your work centered on the communication between cells via so-called extracellular vesicles, EVs abbreviated, and the use of these very small postmen, biological postmen, as therapeutic delivery systems. To further add on these congratulations, your thesis is an extra achievement as it is part of a so-called uh, double PhD degree between the Maastricht University and Coimbra, University of Portugal. And that is a, a, a great achievement. So with great interest, I have read your thesis um, as I also work on these small vesicles, but then on a different topic in vascular calcification. And you have four published papers already, three as a first author in journals with a very high impact. So congratulations. And of course, in these congratulations, I also want to include your promoter team from Maastricht and Coimbra. But we're here today to discuss the content of your thesis, in particular, the role of EVs, microRNAs, and for me, the heart. For that, I want to go to you, to your propositions. And I want to ask you to read proposition number one. Okay. Highly esteemed opponents, thank you for your comments. And uh, my proposition number one says, um, using bioengineering tools, extracellular vesicles can be modulated in numerous ways in order to alter their cargo and surface. Thank you. So actually you addressed two different sides of the EV. One is what is loaded. So the cargo, which I assume microRNA or DNA or protein content. And then you mentioned the surface. So mm -hmm. what is on the surface? And then you can think of the membrane protein, CD9, 81, or 63, like you already mentioned, but also the phosphatidylserine or phosphatidylcholine content. So to warm up a little bit this whole uh, defense, I want to have some questions with you. And if we are on the same page, because the term extracellular vesicle is actually a very broad term. Yes. So just I, I'm shooting some questions to you. So what is the difference in size? Is size, does size matter? Because we have apoptotic bodies, we have extracellular vesicles, we have matrix particles, exosomes, or even ectosomes. What is the difference and which would be the best vesicle? Yes, again, thank you for your question. And yes, I do believe that in this instance, size does matter uh, because fundamentally, empirically, it is a, a measure that we use to distinguish between the different populations that we might uh, obtain from samples. And in fact, all the, the different types of vesicles that you mentioned have a characteristic uh, size range. For example, the exosomes would be between, say, 50 and 200 nanometers, microvesicles or ectosomes, who could be uh, perhaps larger, up to 500 uh, uh, nanometers. Then uh, apoptotic bodies or other particles, such as ectosomes, might be even larger, going up to the micrometer range. Uh, but the fundamental problem with talking about the size of extracellular vesicles, it is uh, as I alluded just now, there is an overlap between the size range of the vesicles. So that is why in recent years, it has been proposed uh, that the nomenclature that we use to describe the vesicles that we work with um, is based uh, exactly on we are, what we are obtaining. For example, if you use uh, te a technique, a method that enriches your vesicles in the small range, for example, in my case, I used mostly ultracentrifugation um, to obtain my vesicles. And this method enriches uh, your sample in small vesicles, typically small vesicles. But as I mentioned, there is overlap and it's not always consistent. And that might mean that uh, along your exosomes, which would be 
in that size range, you yeah. might have some micro vesicles or so maybe, other maybe, maybe just to, to, to specify my question a little bit, which ones would you like to use? The small ones, the intermediate ones, or the large okay. ones? Because there is also a difference if you look at um, um, uh, exosomes, they contain mostly phosphatidylcholine at the outer surface of the, of the vesicle, whereas apoptotic bodies are characterized with phosphatidylserine on the outside of the body, uh, uh, on the vesicle. Yes. So pertaining to which uh, type of vesicle I would be most inclined to use, I would say um, in this case, not only because of the content that they have on their surface, as you just mentioned, but actually due to their size, small extracellular vesicles have a higher chance of getting uh, their biodistribution right when they are applied. Uh, so uh, the larger the particle is, the more trouble it might have doing the margination and extravasation steps during a systemic administration, for example. Uh, and the smaller it is, the better the chance in that case. So if you want to use these biological postmen, you have to induce them from um, generating from cells. You can do so by, for example, um, adding a, a toxic agent and induce apoptosis. And by that, you get apoptotic bodies. But you can also use the multivesicular body compartment or machinery to secrete, for example, um, exosomes. You can also use vesicles that are derived from the ER, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi machinery. Which vesicles would you select so in, in that sense, it really depends on the application that we are thinking, because apoptotic bodies, they are extremely heterogeneous and they might contain bits of organelles or other, other intracellular content that might not be desirable for all applications. And in that sense, the machinery that generates exosomes is a, a more refined and controlled process than the, the production of apoptotic bodies. So I would go with, uh, with the exosome in that case, but again, it is very difficult to actually say that the material that you are working with is an exosome. For that, you would have to catch the vesicle in its biogenesis. Yes. And so the production of these EVs is, is quite challenging eh, to produce a sufficient number of EVs. Would you be thinking of, for example, if you would um, continue in this line of research using synthetically made EVs, so trying to beat nature? Well, yes, I mean, uh, synthetic EVs or something akin to liposomes uh, is something that has been in development, in development in tandem with the research in extracellular vesicles. There are, there are pros and cons uh, to both. And while the production of extracellular vesicles uh, might be challenging, from both uh, uh, a labor and economical point of view when compared to liposome or nanoparticles. Um, I believe that ultimately the biologic product that you end up with might have more advantages to use as a translational tool. I fully agree with you and I'm very happy with your answers. I give the word back to the pro-rector. Thank you. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Girao. Uh, is Professor of Cellular Translation and Cardiology of the University of Coimbra, Professor Girao. Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, dear candidate, I would like to congratulate you and your supervision team for this uh, excellent work. So uh, you have a very uh, well-written thesis with a very interesting preamble focus on very philosophical aspects. And following up this, this part of your thesis, I would start asking you uh, about a more um, conceptual uh, um, point of view that has to do with why do the cells communicate? And assuming that, so this is my opinion, that they can they communicate to establish networks, to ask for help or to exchange information. My question is, can extracellular vesicles uh, play this role? And then a uh, second part of the same questions, how do you see extracellular vesicles? Uh, cells release EVs on purpose, uh, aiming at to establish uh, connections with other cells, like uh, altruistic perspective, or on the other hand, 
cells as part of quality a mechanism of quality control release exosomes as a strategy to get rid of unwanted material and in this case it would be like a selfish perspective what is your opinion okay highly esteemed opponents thank you for your comments and for your questions and uh, in regards to how I view uh, the role of extracellular vesicles in uh, cellular communication, to address your, your second uh, point uh, first, um, I think both options that you mentioned are true. It depends really on, on the context and the microenvironment that the cell is faced with. On the one hand, the research on extracellular vesicles started precisely with a mindset that the vesicles themselves were uh, waste secretion by the cell in order to expel unwanted material. And that is what you mentioned, the selfish perspective, getting rid of things that they don't want. But recent research has also uh, made clear that cells are able to send signals uh, between each other in a uh, very much like a paracrine or endocrine fashion using these extracellular vesicles. So I think they, they do they do, in fact, fulfill the role of uh, a vehicle, a communicator between cells in the sense that that might be the intention uh, of the cell, so to speak. And that could be perhaps attested for, by the fact that uh, cells, for example, when talking about exosomes, they have the ability to uh, regulate and uh, specify the proteins, for example, that you can find on the membrane. And one of those pro proteins commonly found is CDC63. And this particular tetraspanin, um, the amount of, tetras of this tetraspanin and the membrane of vesicles is associated with a higher endosomal escape when the vesicle is uptaken by a recipient cell. And this might indicate then that vesicles that are produced with higher amounts, for example, of this tetraspanin are meant to have their contents released in the cytosol of the target as opposed to degraded by the endolysosomal pathway. So I believe that both options uh, are valid. Yeah, um, right. yeah. So I would ask you, please, could you repeat the, the first part of your question? So the first part is more a philosophical question about how why do the cells communicate? But probably we can move to, to another part because you have partially answered to, okay. to this question. So once the, the, the EVs are released, they can be taken up by uh, uh, other cells, but, can, but they, they can also interact or be retained at the extra, extracellular metric. That is, in my opinion, it's a very important uh, topic. So do you believe that uh, Injury associated extracellular matrix changes, namely, for instance, in the context of heart ischemia, can somehow modulate this retention of EVs and then uh, subsequently to, to, to affect or to impact on the, the, the uptake of EVs by uh, target cells? Yes, I, I do think so, um, that the fact that the extracellular matrix in any given tissue or organ will be different and that will pose uh, a challenge, a uh, different challenge to each uh, target cell that would be able to uptake any given physical. So that is in the context of a heart injury, if you have uh, an extracellular uh, environment that is uh, much more hostile and rough in the sense that you, you might have, for example, more fibrosis uh, acting up surrounding uh, the target cells that in this case could potentially be the cardiomyocytes or the endothelial cells, uh, then I would say this poses a greater challenge uh, for the uptake of EVs by those particular cell types. Yes. And, and for instance, using the, the strategy that you propose in your thesis, the use of exofact to modulate EVs content, and assuming that you can use it as a therapeutic tool, do you believe that the presence of this compound at EV surface can somehow affect the interaction not only with the target cells, but also with extracellular, extracellular matrix, for instance? Uh, yes, I cannot say that I know so, but I suspect so. Because what we outline in, the, in chapter four of my thesis is that, in fact, the exofact causes changes in the surface of the vesicles. And our working hypothesis is that there is an amount of this molecule that uh, persists in the extracellular vesicle, uh, at least outwards. And considering that, 
and the fact that it also elicits particle aggregation and a bit of um, surface charge uh, shift uh, in the vesicles, I would say that um, it, in fact, it might be present uh, when uh, even after the protocol. And in that sense, if it has these aggregative properties, then it might also be extremely important to understand how it would interact with an extracellular matrix. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and uh, the, the use of this exophate, so if I understood it correctly, this allows EVs to escape the endocytic pathway. At least you have lower localization and endocytic markers. So my question is, what alternative routes are EVs using to get access to, uh, to the cytos or the EV content? And can we use this in a broader strategy to modulate EVs regardless of the, the microRNA 155 or other thing? Can we use this strategy to promote uh, endocytic escape of EVs? Well, that is a, a, an excellent question. And the, that last part first, we did not test. So we did not test uh, vesicles um, modulated uh, with exofect, uh, but without the, the corresponding micro rain, at least in terms of, of, the, of the delivery. Um, so we are not entirely sure if that would be, if that would be uh, useful, but I, I do think so, because one of the things that in recent years has been called to attention in terms of endosomal escape has been the fact that there are anionic lipids on the endosomal membrane. And the fact that this uh, molecule, the exofect, seems to have a positive nature, a cationic nature, that might promote the interaction of the vesicles with the membrane of the endosome. And I think it is through there that they are uh, escaping at a higher rate. But uh, regarding the other part of your question to the other routes that the vesicles can take to release their contents uh, in the cytosol, well, they can, of course, fuse directly with a plasma membrane, and we cannot rule out that possibility that this is happening. In fact, in the assays where we did the endocytosis inhibition, uh, those are precisely that. They do not test for direct fusion with the membrane. Uh, so that might be also an option. Okay, thank you very much. I'm okay with the, with the, with the answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Emma Whaley. Uh, she is Professor in Cardiovascular Sciences from the Imperial College in the UK. Professor Emma Whaley. Uh, Professor Emma Whaley, you're on, on mute. Sorry, thank that's you. true. <laughs> thank you. So, Thank you for uh, introducing me and uh, their candidate. Thank you for your presentation. It was really clear. Congratulations on the thesis, the fact that you already published a very high level in several papers. And also I want to congratulate the supervisor team in Coimbra and Maastricht University. It's, it's great uh, work that you have done together. I have uh, a few questions uh, related to the, the source of uh, cells. That you cell, so no, sorry, of oh, exosome or extracellular vesicle that uh, you want to um, submit to your uh, uh, microRNA um, engineering uh, approach. I would like to understand a little bit better what is the criteria that you use to select the source of this uh, AV background to undergo your modification. And I, I, will, I, I will ask question as you answer. <laughs> Okay, uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your comments and for your question. And regarding the source of the vesicles that we used in this work, so the initial approach, uh, because we wanted to develop a tool that would be transversal to different types of vesicles, we chose to use uh, vesicles from different sources uh, to show or try to show that the methods that we were testing were not uh, source specific. So that is, they wouldn't just work in a specific type of vesicle. Uh, so that's why in chapter four, we set out to work with vesicles that came from mononuclear blood cells like lymphocytes and monocytes. So those uh, are cells that we placed in culture and get the, the vesicles from the extracellular medium. We also used uh, primary uh, human vesicles from human urine. And we also used FBS derived vesicles. And these are three widely different sources of material that I believe encompass the bulk of research uh, in extracellular vesicles. So they are sort of an example for each type of uh, material that you can have as a source. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Um, 
But uh, something that I wanted to ask you, basically, all of those different extracellular vesicles will contain their own, uh, you know, macroRNA um, molecules. They will contain uh, uh, protein, lipids, and so. So, how much you think that what is already present in the extracellular vesicle may interact with your macroRNA that you want to deliver to the target cells? And uh, if we stay to the macroRNA only. Uh, what is the comparison between the uh, concentration that you use uh, for the exogenous microRNA and the concentration of the higher express microRNA in the extracellular vesicle? Yes. So uh, regarding the, whether the composition of the vesicles may influence uh, the interaction with uh, any modulation method and the microRNA that we are trying to enrich, that is very true. And perhaps even more so regarding the contaminants that may be present in a specific source of vesicles as opposed to the, the cargo of the vesicle in itself. So we showed in chapter four that regardless of the source of the vesicle, we were able to enrich uh, them in the microRNA. But I believe, and as you might, for example, observe in exosomes or vesicles that come from urine, uh, they have a much greater contamination than other sources. And I believe that that contamination will ultimately affect how our material is interacting with each other, so the vesicles and the microRNA, and how they will interact downstream with the recipient cells. So those considerations are very true. But to make the segue into your the second part of your question, um, in endogenously, the microRNAs that exist in extracellular vesicles, at least in small extracellular vesicles, they are present at a um, the highest uh, amount that you find in nature is about one copy uh, per vesicle. Uh, you might have a few uh, exceptions to that rule, but that, that is the, the, the higher expression ones, you'll find it one copy. Uh, so I believe, and as I show uh, in chapter four as well, that the enrichment is extremely significant using this method, uh, then it means that uh, we are able to increase the amount, at least of this specific microRNA, uh, very, very significantly when compared to what is endogenous to that vesicle. Now, the last consideration that should be taken into account is whether in this situation we have um, a low occupancy and high concentration model. And that means that only a few of the vesicles would contain the majority of the microRNA that we are giving or not. Or if you have a more homogeneous distribution of the microRNA uh, along the, your sample of vesicles. And that is something we cannot answer yet, but uh, both possibilities remain. Thank you very much for your answer. I would like also to ask if you have like kind of uh, inclusion exclusion criteria of the extracellular vesicle based on quality when you want to develop your translational pathway to the clinic for even like a pharmaceutical products. Did you set some uh, like characteristic as some, uh, you know, limit threshold when you accept or not the extracellular vesicle because uh, especially when you work on urine they come from uh, human donor, they could have like, you know, different characteristic. Uh, uh, you can have uh, in the urine extracellular vesicle, they come from different cell type. Um, they could have like different uh, lipidomic profiles. So do you have like, you know, your ideal uh, background extracellular vesicle that you would accept to process, uh, to proceed with the engineer with macroRNA? Yes, so uh, in the context of our work, we did not outline such criteria because this was um, preclinical uh, research and especially because when we would take that step, as you mentioned, to a more translational phase where we are producing uh, particles of clinical value, then also the very methods that we are using to obtain the vesicles would have to change. And uh, consequently, for example, like I mentioned here, I mostly use uh, ultracentrifugation to obtain the vesicles, but that is not uh, necessarily the ideal method when you are thinking about producing vesicles of clinical grade. And um, in that sense, the criteria that we would have to develop, since we haven't we haven't developed that yet, would have to be aligned with the tools that we are using to obtain those vesicles. And regarding the background uh, uh, vesicle or the ideal vesicle that uh, we would we would expect, 
I know that uh, right now there are already some, there is published work in uh, recombinant vesicles uh, that uh, there are standard, they have standard properties that you can compare your sample to and you can normalize your sample to and basically um, compare whether your sample of vesicles is of a high enough quality. Regarding specifically the vesicles that come from the urine, it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, that uh, the source of the vesicles, even if ultimately uh, we discovered that vesicles that originally come from uh, uh, direct uh, body fluids would be a good approach. It doesn't necessarily need to be urine. It could be plasma. It could be another bodily fluid. And in that sense, uh, the criteria that we would have to develop would need to match that as well. Thank you so much for all the answer that you gave. I don't have any further question. I'm satisfied with the uh, you know, answer. Thank you. The opposition will now be continued by uh, Dr. Nevis. He's Associated Professor, Stem Cell Metabolism, also of the University of Coimbra. Hi, uh, good morning all. Um, I would like to congratulate uh, the candidate for a very uh, good thesis, very well, well written, very clear, which uh, I really enjoyed uh, learning uh, with it. Uh, and uh, of course, because I think that in a doctor of uh, philosophy a thesis, we should give the candidate uh, opportunity to, to exercise a, a bit of philosophy. So um, having this in mind, I would like to mention that the preamble of the thesis was very philosophic and I really enjoyed reading it. And uh, there, the candidate mentioned that communication is essential uh, to life, and uh, and not only to life, as uh, but also to 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 society. So I would like to 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 ask the candidate to think a bit on this uh, analogy between what happens in the cell uh, and the EVs, and particularly the microRNAs as a form of communication, uh, and the analogy with an old post office or uh, where, where there's the handling of uh, thousands of letters. Or if he wants, he can go to the now to the digital uh, era that we are living, where we also have these hackers and Trojan horses and virus and uh, phishing and all this that can uh, make our life uh, miserable. And of course, you can also think uh, in the biological field uh, from uh, an engineering point of view, where you can interfere as a hacker with the vehicle of communication the EVs. And uh, because the number of cyber attacks is increasing every year, I would like to ask the candidates to update the number of microRNAs that is present in the human genome. Because uh, in the thesis, there's a, a reference, um, particularly the, the candidate says that the human genome has been estimated to encode more than a thousand microRNAs, which regulates over 60% of the protein coding genes and that mic microRNAs are transcribed in the nucleus by RNA pol 2 as primary microRNAs. And these references are from 2005 and 2008. So they are a bit old. So I'd like uh, the candidate to update uh, a bit uh, on this and tell me what are the current numbers and if it's only pol 2 that is transcribing microRNAs, talk about a bit about microRNA biogenesis. Esteemed opponent, thank you for your comments and for your questions. And in fact, those references are, are a bit outdated in what pertains to microRNA biogenesis. And I believe that uh, current understanding uh, of biogenesis of microRNAs uh, says that when the microRNA is coded in a protein coding gene, indeed RNA polymerase 2 will be mostly responsible for their transcription. And so they will also be polyadenylated and so on. And those are inherently different from microRNAs that are in non-coding regions of the genome, which may be transcribed by RNA polymerase 3. Um, but the downstream processing that occurs, uh, although there are some differences, it will be fundamentally the same. So the microprocessor with Russia and so forth uh, will still occur. Um, regarding- But, but uh, just let me- Put a bit uh, more of info there because if if it is in a in an exon, mm -hmm. if the microRNA is present in an exon, you have also to consider uh, alternative splicing, of course, right? So yes. you have a competition between different processing uh, machinery inside inside the the cell. So uh, putting a bit of another layer on on top of this discussion, 
uh, if you think that microRNAs live inside uh, uh, genes, there's also here the, the discussion if these microRNAs can be pro uh, gene where the host the, they are hosted, if they can be pro gene or against the gene. And I would like to, to have a bit of um, your comment on that. Yes, so regarding uh, the, the point where microRNA might be coded in an exon uh, sequence, in fact, uh, in that case, uh, for the microRNA to actually be expressed as a non-coding entity, there will have to be splicing occurring. And for that to happen, um, I am not entirely sure if, uh, what the, if there is a competition mechanism at play in there or if it is predetermined prior to the binding of the polymerase to the sequence. I'm not entirely sure on that. Um, but regarding the... Um, what has been described is that there is a bit of competition between the different processing uh, machines. And that, uh, on top of that, uh, um, I would like to ask if you know what is, uh, you know, behind this processivity, if, if you know what determines uh, the, the, um, if it is splicing or if it is drosha that is coming in. Yeah, or so if, you, if you want to, to, to speculate a bit on that. Uh, in my understanding, which I also know is a bit, uh, maybe a bit lacking in, the, in this point, um, there are uh, non-coding regions which may be upstream of the sequence that will host the, the microRNA or the gene uh, that have a, an important role in regulating uh, how the downstream sequence uh, will be eventually transcribed and how it present, even presents itself in terms of uh, chromatin. So how the accessibility of the site uh, is directly uh, influenced by upstream non-coding sequences. And in that sense, there are, I know that there are uh, regulation loops that may occur. So for example, if a microRNA uh, is essential to the functioning of a particular uh, uh, signaling pathway, let's say in the cell, and uh, the pathway needs to be activated, then you may have uh, a feedback loop occurring where that if on a homeostasis a case, if that microRNA that is in an exon would not necessarily be available to be um, transcribed by RNA polymerase uh, to... Yes, it, it also directly. depends on the speed. But I, yeah. I would like to, uh, to have another question before we end our discussion. You say that, uh, well, for going directly for the in vivo work, uh, why did you choose the Prestwick library? Because for me, it doesn't really make much sense. I would like to have your comments on that. Because if it was to, to, to change the endogenous production of microRNAs, yes, maybe the Prestwick library would be a good option. But to load microRNAs inside vesicles, it's a bit, for me, it was a bit strange. Yes. So the Prestwick library was chosen for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them was, of course, that uh, we had it available to start the protocols or there were practical reasons. But fundamentally, we knew that uh, there were compounds in this library that had some features that may resemble uh, what uh, exofact or not resemble necessarily the exofact structure, but may resemble the properties that we attribute to exofact that make it a good EV loading agent. And what are those characteristics? So that might be what we think is, for example, the cationic nature uh, of the molecule might be at play and the fact, the fact that might be a small molecule as well. Uh, of it's, course- It's probably just because they all bind DNA. They all in there, that's why they are used in the Prestwick library as therapeutic yeah. drugs because they bind nucleic acids, right? So some of them, some of them do, not necessarily Actually, all, all. All your hits, they bind DNA. The hits, yes, but the, from the 1200 compounds, I don't think they, they all do. But, uh, but yes, they, they all share certain characteristics, at least the hits, they share certain characteristics. And that was the rationale behind that. There was another practical reason, which was the fact that these compounds were already approved for clinical use. And so we tried to harness a bit of serendipity, if you will, in uh, yeah. trying to get a compound that on the one hand, uh, not only has been approved for clinical use, but on the other hand, might already have a beneficial effect in a particular pathological context. So I understand uh, the far-fetchedness of the library, but these were the reasons why we chose it. Okay. I would love to be here all morning discussing science with you, but uh, unfortunately we cannot do it. I'm very happy with the answers.
Thank you. And I give the, the, the word back to the prorector. Thank you. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Hendrik. She's Professor of Experimental Cancer Research of the University of Ghent. Professor Hendricks. So, dear candidate, it was also a pleasure from uh, my side to read um, the PhD thesis, the high quality work that you have performed. So, this means that you have also uh, received some excellent guidance by your supervisors during the past couple of years. And it's also very nice. Uh, we met during the MBO course. You were one of the participants. So from my point of view, it's also very nice to see how the knowledge that you gained during the course has been implemented in your uh, PhD thesis. So, so congratulations for that. Of course, I still have some uh, technological questions left for you. Um, so my first question relates to chapter two, where you provide an introduction to the different properties of EVs that should be considered when um, modulating their content or using them for delivery purposes. And you describe as biophysical um, parameter size and charge, but I'm actually missing one. Do you know which other um, characteristic biophysical I would be looking for. You implement it actually in different chapters, but I do not see it listed there. Yes, highly esteemed opponent. Thank you for your comments and for your question. I think perhaps the physical property you might be referring to is density of the particles. Yes. 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 Perfect. So my question related to that is, do you have an idea whether the density of EVs would also influence the loading of EVs and also their um, delivery or their, their targeting to different cells. Do you know anything about that? Or did you explore that in your PhD? Um, I did not explore that directly, but I can speculate a bit on, on the answer to your question. And I think that, yes, the in fact, the density of the particle is an important uh, physical property of the particle, and uh, it is determined by what the particle is. So it depends on the size, it depends on the, on the, and the compounds that are present both in the lumen and the surface of the vesicle. So those are the, the molecules that eventually determine the density of the particle. And in that regard, uh, particles uh, with a higher density they first, first of all, they correlate positively with particles of a larger size as well, or often they do. And so uh, that in itself uh, might already uh, present uh, a different perspective on how it interacts with, uh, with any loading agent or any strategy that we might want to employ. Uh, regarding uh, the application of those vesicles with uh, different densities, like I mentioned before, I think that for uh, a more translational and industrial application, uh, other methods other than the ultra centrifugation that I use would be preferable. And one of them is the, the ODG method. And of course, um, maybe uh, perhaps also followed with, follow with by chromatography, size exclusion chromatography. And this couple of techniques together, they uh, produce uh, vesicles that are not only more standard in size, but also more standard in density. And in that sense, that might be a, a venue worth to pursue. Yeah, yeah. So I agree. It's basically speculation because not much is known about it, but it, I think, still remains uh, an important aspect to address. So related to the exofact um, loading, you also focus on small EVs and um, you indicate that small EVs um, will have a, a better biodistribution profile if you do a systemic administration. But in um, chapter five, you do a, a topical admission. So I'm wondering whether large EVs, because um, I think most of the research is focusing on small EVs, but large EVs should also have relevance why cells are producing large EVs and what could be their beneficial aspects. So I think for topical admission, there may be also an opportunity for large EVs to maybe, maybe you can even load microRNAs, you can reduce the dose number of EVs that you would need to administer. Can you speculate on that or provide your vision on the use of large EVs and also whether ExoFact would work as efficient on large EVs compared to small EVs? Yes. Um, so I think that uh, 
to the first point when we use the when we do the topical administration of vesicles and we use the small EVs. Um, so this is following up on the previous line of work where we worked with the small EVs. So it's a continuity uh, question of the research line to use the choice of that material. I think that a larger EVs like micro vesicles could also be employed with similar effects. Um, however, there is one aspect of the exofact um, modulation that worries me, particularly with large EVs, which is the fact that it tends to aggregate particles. And it does so on small EVs, and I should expect it to have a similar effect on larger ones. Mm -hmm. And the caveat that I see in this regard is that uh, while most endocytic routes are able to uptake a couple of small EVs when they are uh, aggregates, to, for example, clathrin mediated lipid raft or caveolin, they might be able to take in some small aggregates. If we're talking about aggregates of larger particles, then perhaps they would only be available for uh, phagocytic and micropinocytic processes. And that might constrain, constrain the, the way that the vesicles are uptaken by the cells. So that, that would be a worry that I had, but in terms of, of techno the technological point of view, whether exofact would work with micro vesicles, uh, I think it would work uh, in a very similar way. Of course, dosages would have to be um, uh, uh, re rethought, but uh, th that would be my speculation. Mm -hmm. And related to the loading of the, the extracellular vesicles, do you ha have any idea? And because micro RNAs are very heterogeneously present between different EVs. So you have EVs without a microRNA and you have some with multiple uh, microRNAs. How is it with the loading? Do you think you have a homogeneous loading of microRNAs across every single EV that is present in your sample? So yes, this was uh, what I was discussing uh, a few minutes ago. There is um, what we call the low occupancy and high concentration model which is a working hypothesis where the majority of the microRNA that we get in our sample would actually be located in just a few of the vesicles. And in terms of downstream effect, that is not really distinguishable or easily distinguishable in cells than if it is an homogeneous distribution. So we do not really uh, know uh, if uh, that is happening or not. What I can say is that if this would be the case, if uh, only a small percentage of the vesicles uh, engulf the majority of the microRNA that we put in the sample, then I would expect a higher variability uh, on downstream results, because then they would be very much contingent on whether those specific vesicles would be uptaken or not. And I think that would increase the variability that we see in our results. Yeah. So right now, I would be more inclined towards a more homogeneous distribution. Yeah. So a final question. Um, did you ever check the stability of the exofact um, uploaded EVs? In blood, for example, because if you do go for a therapeutic application, you also want to make sure that um, the method that you use to upload microRNAs does not affect the stability of the EVs. Yes, so we did some stability tests. Uh, for example, we did the storage test, of course, and we verified that, for example, freezing and thawing at minus 80 degrees does not seem to affect the, the bioactive potential of the modulated vesicles. But regarding the stability in fluids, there were some tests that we did, not in blood, but in plasma, and it didn't seem to affect at least uh, the profiles that we observed uh, in terms of NTA analysis. Um, but uh, that does not say much uh, about how the vesicle itself would behave in circulation. Uh, there are other papers that use the exofact methodology, and they did describe uh, the integrity of the vesicles. And for the most part, they, they do seem to hold up in blood. OK, thank you for your answers. Very satisfied. The opposition will be continued by uh, Dr. Kozemans. She is Associated Professor of Patent Research of this university. Dr. Kozemans. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. While we are approaching the final few minutes of your PhD defense, I would like to keep my congratulations very brief. And I would like to ask you to read proposition number nine for me, please. Okay. Esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. And proposition number nine is, 
what one generation finds ridiculous, the next accepts, and the third shudders when it looks back on what the first did. Yeah, I would like to ask you to philosophize on this, this proposition, and you may choose which generation you want to be, the first, <laughs> second, or third, uh, and choose an example related to your thesis topic, um, and, yeah, and um, discuss about this proposition. Okay, so I think that depending on the perspective that we that we take, we could be in any of the generations. We could be in the first generation, developing novel treatments that two generations from now yep. will seem very archaic, or we can look back on our own history and think that the approaches that we took 30, 40 years ago were themselves a lacking. So I, th I think the beauty of the quote is that uh, while it reminds you that what you are doing um, is not uh, eternal and it will evolve uh, whether you like it or not, it also reminds you that what you are doing comes from a line of research that was already there before you started. And that mm -hmm. might, might give you some encouragement. And specifically to the EV field, how do you think the future will look like? And what, do, what will the next generation uh, or the third generation find ridiculous when looking back? Yeah, I think, I think that um, the EV field will fundamentally evolve towards more standardized practices, towards the idea that... Um, um, yeah, candidate, you have one minute or less than a minute, preferably to answer this question. So please do briefly, and then we end this okay. ceremony. Briefly, then I think uh, the field will evolve towards more standardized practices and the future generations will look on the work that we did and they will learn from it, but they will also see how it could have evolved. And that is what they will do. Thank you. Thank you. I give the word back to the pro-rector. The time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return.
You are mute, ProRector. I apologize, it's a mistake I always make. Regarding uh, quality, the degree committee here present online has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Ferreira, uh, is, and uh, Professor Martins uh, are authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in, according, in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Thank you. Well, first I have to ask you something very important. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times? to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I promise. Good, then, by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon, upon you, Ricardo Cerqueira de Abreu, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by costume and law. As evidence of this, you will soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the supervisor fixed with the official seal of the university shown by the Bido. There you go. That's the moment we should take a nice picture, but well. <laughs> okay. Dear Dr. Abreu, Dear Ricard, I have the pleasure to be one of the first to congratulate you for this achievement. I would also like to congratulate your parents, your girlfriend Sandra, family and friends. You should all be so proud of this young PhD. What a journey this was. Since I met you, I knew you would succeed. First of all, being recommended by Ugu already sets the bar quite high. But getting to work with you and know you better clearly showed us the intelligent and dedicated person that you are. We know each other for a while already. You joined my lab in 2014 or 2015 as a master's student on a challenging project where you needed to screen for angiogenic microRNAs. It was hard work where you needed to establish new techniques and new tools, but you were determined and resilient. And in the end, you generated high quality and relevant data by identifying new microRNAs that were further investigated and described in nice and relevant publications afterwards, either by you or other PhD students. No way I would let you go back. So glad you also joined working in our group and accepted our or my offer to remain working with us in collaboration with a group of Linu and Ugu in Pimber under a joint double degree agreement between the University of Maastricht and the University of Coimbra. And then the adventure started, the real adventure. And we have learned so much together. Your, your character quickly let you become that special person in our group with your dry jokes, difficult words and high standards that everyone enjoys having around as a colleague and a friend. And what an adventure. So now we've learned all about these books and how books can relate to EV. So I would like to cite something from one of your favorite uh, books or authors. Maybe you will recognize it. And we shouldn't be here at all if we would know more about it before we started. But I suppose it's often that way. The brave things in the old tales and songs, Mr. Frodo. Adventures, as I used to call them. I used to think that they were things the wonderful folk of the stories went out and looked for because they wanted them, because they were exciting and life was a bit dull. A kind of sport, as you might say. But that's not the way as you put it. But I expect they had lot, lots of chances, like us, of turning back, only they didn't. And if they had, we shouldn't know because they have been forgotten. I can imagine there were many times that deep down made you think of turning back. The bureaucracy, many experimental challenges, COVID, and all the delays attached to that. But now that you're here, all that should be forgotten. I already did. And only the good things remain. The wonderful papers you produced in the past four years, the presentation prices, the friends you made in the lab, the nice team building moments, etc. 
It was a pleasure working with you and I hope you feel the same way. If I can just give you a recommendation, try to not be too demanding with yourself. A uh, Western blot, a blot looking beautiful, but with one black spot on the left upper corner that nobody sees, only you, is still a beautiful blot and not a negative result. I think you understand what I mean. I wish you all the best in your future career and personal life, and hopefully we'll be able to catch up on some nice vegan dinners that were missed during COVID. And if you ever reconsider academia, you know where to find me. So once again, Ricardo, and I think I can say this on behalf of Lino and Hugo, we are so proud of you. Congratulations. Thank you, Paula. Dear Dr. Chequeria Group, I apologize for my Portuguese, which is zero of quality. Um, also, on behalf of the Board of Deans, I congratulate you with the honor you have acquired. Uh, I must, for your family and your girlfriend, I must maybe elaborate very briefly that a doctorate in the Dutch university system is the highest degree someone can achieve. So you truly reached a milestone, but I understand that you feel that you're still on a journey. And we do hope, given the quality of your thesis and also the judgment of the degree committee, that we all felt that we hope that you will continue your journey in research, or to quote your favorite uh, writer, roads go ever on over rock and under tree. So I do hope that you will continue your journey. And uh, on behalf of the university, I hereby declare this ceremony to be ended. Thank you. I do ask the degree committee, I do ask the degree committee to stay on for a few minutes because you can congratulate